By way of introduction, I want to quote some lines from the 10th and final Duino elegy of Rainer Maria Rilke. I don't know if anybody reads him anymore, but describing, I'm sorry, you do? Oh, Mike, Mike, okay. Describing the booths, that's his word, booths in a fair, let's call it art fair, that can please the most curious tastes, I'm quoting him, he asserts, there's one especially worth seeing for adults only, the breeding of money, anatomy made amusing, money's organs on view, nothing concealed, instructive and guaranteed to increase fertility, close quote. I will suggest that the irrational exuberance, which is a term by a prominent Yale economist, title of a book, of the contemporary art market is about the breeding of money, not the fertility of art, and that commercially precious works of art have become the monkey organs of money. They exist to increase the generative value and staying power of money the power of money to breed money, to fertilize itself, not the value and staying power of art. Money supposedly has no value in itself, that is, it is valuable for what one could exchange it for, but I will suggest the surge of art buying is money's parthenogenetic way of saying that it is valuable in itself. Indeed, value distilled to purity, the quintessence of value in capitalist society, which is what we're living in. The first part of my talk is going to have these kinds of ruminations about the meaning of the dominance of money over art as I see it uh, in the current situation. Then I'll get down to some analysis of what this list means precisely and empirically as I can. And then I'll go back to some of the consequences as I see it for art. Many years ago, Maya Shapiro argued that there was a radical difference between art, spiritual, and commercial value. He warned against the nihilistic effect of collapsing their difference. I will argue that today in the public mind and perhaps in the unconscious of many artists, there is no difference. The commercial value of art has usurped its spiritual value, indeed seems to determine it. Art's aesthetic, cognitive, emotional, and moral value, its value for what I call the dialectical varieties of critical consciousness has been subsumed by the value of money. Art has never been independent of money, this is well documented, but now it has become a dependency of money. Consciousness of money is all pervasive. It informs art, virtually everything in capitalist society, the way absolute spirit once did, as Hegel thought. Money has always invested in art, as though admiring, even worshiping, what it respected as its superior, the true treasure of civilization. But today, money's hyperinvestment in art, implicitly an attempt to overwhelm it, to force it to surrender, is implicitly an attempt to overwhelm it, to force it to surrender its supposedly higher values, strongly suggests that money regards itself as superior to art. Art's willingness, as I would argue, even eagerness to be absorbed by money, to aestheticize money, as it were, suggests that art, like every other enterprise, from the cultural to the technological, and culture has become an extension and even mode of technological practice in many quarters, is a way of making and worshiping money, a way of affirming capitalism. Indeed, it is a way of signaling the triumph of capitalism over socialism. That is, the unimpeded pursuit of money and profit at the cost of the common human good that might be achieved by the redistribution of capitalist generated wealth. Capitalism moves in where communism has failed however much both let down human beings, if in different ways, as the opening of Sotheby's auction houses in ex-communist countries suggests. They are in effect beachheads of capitalism, much the way the priests who accompanied the conquistadors were beachheads of Christianity. If the 2006 list of art prizes, prices is any clue, the old technology of painting remains the most successful way of making money suggesting that painting, however supposedly dead or mourning for itself, remains economically viable. I'm referring to some of the theories there. Even more interestingly, money's respectability has made once disrespectful avant-garde art, art once scornfully irreverent towards capitalist society, art that claimed to be a spiritual revolution against its material values, respectable. 
Today, it is no longer a matter of art legitimating and celebrating the power that is money, but of money legitimating and appropriating art by making it a capitalist fiefdom. Inevitably, one must recall Andy Warhol's prescient idea of business art. That is, his recognition that art has become a business and making money in business is an art. Of course, business art is his term, implying that the making of money and the making of art involve the same motivation. You may recall that Warhol said he began as a commercial artist, then he passed through this thing called art, as he said, and went back to commercial art. Okay. A new hierarchy of value has been established. Art serves and supports money. When money showers its blessings on art the way Jupiter showered money on Danai, art spreads its legs in gratitude. The days when Mark Rothko said, I quote Rothko, that the artist can abandon his plastic bank book, that was in 1947, are over. So are the days when art seemed timeless and transcendental, to use his words. Money is timeless and transcendental, and anyone, artist or otherwise, who abandons his or her bank book looks like a self-destructive fool. Since Rothko wrote, we have witnessed the slow but steady encroachment of money on art. Escalating auction prices confirm that the capitalization of art is complete. And I think that's the most important event of the last 50 years, sociologically speaking, about art. Money has completely conquered art. Art has become a species of money. In fact, you can take out loans against art uh, works from many uh, uh, banks, Citibank, for example. Collectors and dealers look like conquistadors, cornering the market in a particular art to extract the last bit of money from it. They pan for gold in art, search for the holy grail of gold, indifferent to the meaning it had for the natives who valued artistic gold because it had the radiance of the sun god, symbolized its life-giving power. It was a spiritual light confirming that art was sacred, that is, a necessity of life and mind. Art was spirit in material form, the material of art a means to a spiritual end. Art was always inwardly fine, whatever profane form it took. Dura, Albrecht Dura, in his diaries, notes and understood this when he mourned explicitly the melting of many sacred works of pre-Columbian fine art for their gold, a process he witnessed on his visit to the emperor's court in what was then the Spanish Netherlands. We're talking about 500 years ago. Only art that makes money finds its way into the textbooks, I would argue, which sometimes seem like rationalizations of auction results. Official art history tends to follow the lead of the art markets, consciously as well as unconsciously. Just take a look at what's left out of the textbooks, say Arneson, for example. The triumph of money over art is the final triumph of the pure capitalist spirit that Marx described in the Communist Manifesto, 1848. While Schumpeter's important idea of capitalism as what he called creative destruction is a proper retort to Marx, the issue today with respect to art is whether capitalism has a destructive limiting effect on creative freedom or whether it is an adequate stimulus to creativity whether the wish to economically profit from making art makes for a spiritually profitable art. Is the convergence of art and money, the equating of art with money, healthy or unhealthy for the artist, however much it may be a sign of healthy capitalism? <laughs>